All right, chapter three, point-to-point -point connections. We're going to talk about what point-to-point -point connections are, how PPP operates, how to configure PPP, and then some basic troubleshooting stuff. All right, what is point-to-point? -point? Basically, anytime your business is going to expand, you know, in the old days, we just grew the headquarters building bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but that model has kind of gone the way of the dinosaur, and now what we do is we typically buy remote offices. You know, years ago, hospitals would buy more land around them and put up bigger buildings that all interconnected, so they made these huge hospital buildings. But that's not really happening now. What's happening now is these hospital systems are buying businesses six miles down the street, a health and wellness center, um, you know, a north facility, a south facility, things like that, because they're expanding their reach in the communities or their areas where they're at. So what happens, you know, what happens when you buy a new office, you know, 10 miles down the road? And you need, they need to connect to your Internet and your email and things like that. Well, basically what you do is you call your providers, you know, AT&T, Time Warner Cable, whoever does stuff in your area, and you negotiate um, a point-to-point -point connection, which typically is a T1 or an E, or I'm sorry, a T3, unless you're over in Europe, in which case it's an E1, as an Echo 1, um, or an E3. Uh, but here in the U.S., we do T1s and T3s. So, but again, that landscape is also changing. These... Um, crap, um, point to point links that we're talking about. They're really kind of going away. You know, um, right now Time Warner Cable in our area has laid a, a boatload of fiber. Um, the medical group that we work with, the radiologists, they actually have private fiber um, between all the hospitals. So they're able to call up AT, or I'm sorry, Time Warner Cable and say, hey, we need a fiber link between this building and this building. And Time Warner Cable put it in. So because of the demands for speed, you know, with SQL Server databases and radiology images and things like that, you know, the old days of the T1 aren't really working out for us too much anymore. But this chapter is more focused on the T1. Hey, I got a small office down the road. They only need internet and email and access to files. Um, so I'm just going to put in a T1. So what happens is you talk to your provider and you say, hey, I need a T1 from this location to this location. And they come back and give you a quote. And then after you accept the quote, you kind of negotiate what's going to happen. Now, typically, they tell you what you're going to get or they tell you, here's your choices. And they may say, hey, you got the choice between you know, HDLC for encapsulation or PPP. Or, or they may just tell you, hey, you know, we, we use HDLC and we use this frame code. Or I'm sorry, line code and they give you a sheet that has this information listed so that you can set up your end of the point to point. So nine times out of ten the provider is going to tell you what you're going to get unless you're a specific company like um, finance or something that has you know like patient information or patient financial records in which case that stuff needs to be secure then you're obviously much more concerned about that so during the negotiation phase with the different providers you're going to be talking about who's going to give you the most secure link but for your average small to medium business is really um, you're going to be doing HDLC in our area so that's what happens so what is it's a serial link that connects uh, the two different points so what happens is they run a, a piece of copper from the nearest telephone pole into your one building and then that piece of copper goes from the telephone pole to a, a, a junction box somewhere and then fiber connects it to um, a central office and then that central office connects to the, the, the next closest central office with fiber and then they have a fiber link that goes out to a junction box and then that junction box goes to the copper to the telephone pole and it goes to the other end and they lay copper to the other end. So basically they go to the, the telephone nearest to your two locations and then they run private copper um, from that telephone pole into your building and that's your two ends. And then they do all the processing inside their network. And they give you your information that you're going to use. Now there's three standards, RS-232 which is serial, um, V35 or HSSI. Don't worry too much about that. Um, you're going to be using a serial connection. So these point-to-point -point links, uh, the book wants you to make it clear, they can be very short a mile or two down the road, or they can be very far. Um, the farthest one we ever had was from you know, this, our area to the Bolivar uh, area, um, which was about a 35-minute drive. Um, so that was, and then it was like $500 a month for the T1. 
But you can get these, you know, again, in this example, from New York to London, stuff like that. Imagine how much that one's going to cost. So typically, the farther away you go, the more central offices that they have to negotiate through, um, the more pricey your stuff is going to be. All right, they always talk about um, multiplexing in this chapter, and I, I've never quite understood why. Um, but basically, multiplexing is just mixing multiple signals into one. Years ago, when T1s were really expensive uh, and several hundred dollars was, was way too expensive for a normal company, we used to use a multiplexer to connect offices. So we would put up, um, we would buy four phone lines for 35 bucks a piece or something like that, and then those four phone lines would go into a box, and then they would connect to four phone lines on, at the at the other location, and that box would use the four phone lines to load balance the the traffic between the two buildings. Um, but so that's what they're talking about. You know, I've got data. Um, I have no idea what E stands for, entertainment, and then F is film. Um, so all this stuff is going into the multiplexer and it kind of spits it out into one solid stream. So that's what they're talking about with time division multiplexing. With that, everybody gets an equal share um, of the time. So for every three E's, you also get three F's, that kind of stuff. Now with statistical time division multiplexing, you can dedicate you know, more time slots for the things that are more important to you. Like in this case, um, data only gets two where E or entertainment or whatever that E was for, you know, he gets four time slots. So you can increase the, the, the priority for certain traffic. So other than that, I've never seen that come up on the CCNA. Um, I don't know anybody using uh, the old MUX or multiplexing boxes for phone lines anymore. Um, but you never know when you're going to run into a small mom and pop business that's going to have some weird stuff going on um, and that hasn't updated their stuff in 10, 15 years. All right, no, enough of this multiplexing example. All right, the DMARC. Remember, the demarcation point is the last piece of equipment that's provider owned. It's typically a smart jack, which is the end. It's like a big NIC card for T1s um, that they put, they mount in a box, and that's all locked up. Uh, and that way people can't screw with it. And then on the bottom of the box, there's an RJ45. So then you would plug your Ethernet cable into that RJ45 and then plug it into your router and that's how you would connect to your T1. Alright, here's kind of a picture of a smart jack. Again, this box or this big white box is about the size, a little bit bigger than a bread box, and inside there you get a card for every T1 that you have. Now the first time you order a T1 you'll get a very small box, but as you order more T1s um, they'll eventually put in a bigger box. And what happens is somewhere around here, wherever this mouse is, um, these circuit IDs come into the building and then they plug in somewhere to the box, they put the smart jack in, then here on the bottom or somewhere uh, there's an RJ45 port that you would plug in and then that's how you would connect. So nine times out of ten the smart jack is going to be the D mark and that's what's going to happen like let's say your T1 goes down and you get a call AT&T they're going to send a guy out and then he's going to unplug you from the smart jack and plug his test equipment into the smart jack and then he's going to test that line from his point the D mark all the way back into the central office so then he'll call somebody at the central office and he'll do some tests back and forth and that's the only thing they test if they have to look at your equipment, it's very expensive. Like I'm, I want to say it was 240 for a half hour or the first 15 minutes. It was something crazy. So you never want to get involved with that. Plus, you don't want an AT&T guy looking at your router. I guarantee you that's the last person you want to touch your router. Um, those guys are not network engineers. Um, AT&T over the years have lost a lot of their good guys and they hire subcontractors and other weird stuff and <coughs> they just teach them how to push the buttons for their test equipment. <coughs> Can't tell you how many times I've had to argue with a guy because um, he's told me the T1 was up and I've had to explain to him that the T1 was not up. Uh, that kind of thing. But anyway, I digress. So again, remember, the local loop is just your connection from the central office, your closest central office, into your building. So typically it goes from the central office and then there's, there's fiber that goes underneath the ground to a um, big junction box somewhere. And then that junction box feeds the wires to the telephone poles. Um, and then it goes into the houses and the, or the, the surrounding businesses. Uh, so then it would come into your building. Now, they used to have a separate CSU-DSU. 
you'll see these little white ADTRAN boxes. You know, years ago, the CSU-DSU was not built into the, the WIC card. It was a separate device. Um, and typically the devices were white and they're made by ADTRAN. Although now if you see them, they're like a creamy, nasty yellow color because they're, they're, they've yellowed with age and stuff like that. Um, but we typically don't use those anymore. We just go right from the router into the smart jack. So just don't forget the D mark is the last piece of provider owned equipment. After the D mark, it's all your stuff. Your provider, when there's an issue with the T1, only tests from the D mark to the central office. They do not test your stuff. All right, this, this part should be easy. Remember, every serial cable has a DTE end and a DCE end. The T is for terminal or terminate and the C is for control, but I like to refer to it as clock. So the DCEN has to provide the clock rate. So when you have serial interfaces, you're, either your provider is gonna get, send the clock rate to you, so you're gonna be the DTEN, or if we're in the lab, you're setting it up yourself, one end of your cable is a DCEN, and that has to set the clock rate. Remember, with serial communication, it happens one bit at a time, so somebody has to set the rate for that one bit. Um, and typically in class we do clock space rate space 64000. Alright, and again we still use these old nasty Winchester block cables. Why? Because ah, they're so nasty. When you only need, you know, uh, three inches of cable, why do we have 24 feet cables or foot cables? I have no idea. I didn't order those, so don't ever blame that one on me. Uh, and then here's your WIC card member. WIC stands for WAN interface card. This one is just a serial. So this end would go here into your port, and then this end would go connect to this end, and then this end would go into the other router's card like this. All right, so bandwidth, again, a T1 is 1.544 megabits per second. A T3 is 44.736 megabits per second. The OCs are optical carrier or fiber connections. Um, but when we're doing private, we typically do T1 and T3s. Now a T3, I think, is 27 or 28 T1s. So around about your 8th or 9th T1, um, it starts getting cheaper to buy a T3. And what happens is you buy a T3 and they put in a private piece of copper or fiber, depending on who, what company you're working with, between your building and the central office. And then every new T1 you buy, you just have to pay from, from the central office to that location. You no longer have to pay for the local loop because you've got a big local loop that you can use. But again, that's a story for another time. And then there's, there's E1s and E3s. Remember, Europe uses the E1s. We use a T1 here in the U.S. All right. When you're doing a lease line, again, that's when you call AT&T and say, hey, I need a T1 and I want to lease it for five years um, or three years or something like that. Um, that. So again, they call that a lease line. And that is a circuit switch line. You pay for a specific circuit through the provider's network. Now, what's common today in our area is to do um, MPLS. So basically you pay for packet switching across the provider's network. And we've talked about this in class, the difference between circuit switch and packet switch in every class, so you should have that down. Just make sure you remember circuit switch, you pay for a private dedicated circuit, and if that circuit goes down anywhere, you're down. Packet switch, you're just paying to get through the provider's network any way you can. So if a link goes down, they'll just reroute you somewhere else. All right. HDLC, in our area, last I remember, and again, it's been about five years um, since I've done a T1, uh, the last nine T1s I did, AT&T always offered HDLC encapsulation um, because we did not require authentication. So if you're not requiring authentication, HDLC is kind of the way to go. Cisco also has their own proprietary extension um, of HDLC called CHDLC. Um, and again, it's very easy. Just the, the command is just encapsulation HDLC, and you're all set. Now remember, encapsulation is you know the how we form the header. Um, what's the format for the header? And remember, we encapsulate as we go down through the OSI model. You know, we add the port number, we add the IP address, we add the MAC address. So this encapsulation refers to you know how we format the packet to go across this private link. All right. Again, they talk about the frames. Uh, you know, through the, the CCNA is the entry level stuff. Nobody's going to hire a CCNA and then expect them to run Wireshark and dig through all the frames and find issues with the frames and things like that. 
So why they hammer the frames in the CCNA, I have no idea. Now there's some frames you kind of need to understand, but I don't ever see you ever troubleshooting HDLC frames as an entry level CCNA. So don't worry too much about this. So again, to turn HDLC on, you just go to the interface and just encapsulation HDLC. Woohoo! And you're all done. Now, they also don't talk about, um, we used to always have to do a line code as well that was like um, E8, Z8 or something like that. Um, it's been so long I don't even remember. Uh, but there may be additional settings for your provider. So make sure that you talk to your provider and see which ones uh, obviously they need. But as far as the CCNA goes, in order to turn on HDLC, you just go to the interface and say, hey, encapsulation HDLC. All right. So the big two commands are show interface serial, and that'll show you what encapsulation you're using, which HDLC is the default, or show controllers. Now, when I took the CCNA, they always asked you, you know, well, the question was, you know, how do you see which end of the cable you're connected to? And the answer is show controllers. If you do show controllers serial 000, it will show you whether you have the DCE or the DTE end, and what your clock rate is. So I don't know if they still cover that on the CCNA, but just in case, you need to know that. So show controllers will show you the cable type and, and the end going to you, and then show interface will show you the encapsulation type. All right, then they cover some troubleshooting. Um, really, there's not a whole lot of troubleshooting. If the line is down, nine times out of 10, your frickin' provider is hosed. Um, and if your provider's AT&T, that's such a huge, bloated, nasty organization. Nine times out of ten, it's their issue. Their lines go down uh, every month. Uh, Say so we had nine T1s, and not a month went by when we did not have one of the nine T1s that was down for some reason. And then we had to call, make a ticket, blah blah blah. But you get the idea. So what you want to see, you know, show I or um, yeah, show IP interface brief. Um, and hey, serial one is up, line protocol is up. That's normal operation. Obviously, if the serial is down, your router is not getting a, a carry to text signal from the T1. Uh, your carrier is having a problem that's not sending the signal. Your cabling is faulty. Somebody hit something in the road. Remember, you're only responsible for your router and the cable from your router into the smart jack or the DMARC. So once that's operational, what's the chance of that going down? Slim and none. Now, what's the chance of the smart jack or the cable from the smart jack that goes to the telephone pole or the cable that goes from the telephone pole to the junction box or the underground cable going from the junction box to the central office or somebody screwing something up at the central office? That's where your problem is nine times out of ten. So I'm going to skip that crap because, um, again, <laughs> your serial cable goes down, you need to call AT&T. Especially, you know, check your stuff and make sure nothing's switched. Check your cable to make sure you know, both ends are in. Um, unplug, plug it back in just to test, and then after that, it's AT&T's issue. Trust me. All right, now we're going to talk about PPP. Uh, PPP is point-to-point -point protocol, and it's made up of three different layers. It has like an HDLC-like encapsulation. Then it has a, a link control protocol to establish the, the connection and test the data. And then it has an NCP layer um, that works with all the different protocols out there, whether you're running IP4, IP6, um, Novell, IPX, SPX, or Apple Talk. So PPP is typically the way you go, especially if you want any kind of like authentication on your point-to-point -point, uh, links. And PPP is um, a non-Cisco proprietary, so it's an open source. So if you're dealing with non-Cisco routers, um, you want to use PPP. All right, again, advantages of PPP, it's not proprietary, and it has some extra features not available in HDLC, such as authentication. Woohoo! All right, they talk about the PPP session. So with PPP, we establish, um, first we talk, so we do like a handshake, and we say, hey, um, I want to establish a link with you. And then you say, hey, that's great, blah, 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 and I do this. So there's a whole, there's a better slide for this. So here you go. So I, I initiate the conversation, and then you acknowledge that we can start a conversation. So the LCP members like the control layer. It says, hey, we can do this. So then we'll exchange information um, to see what protocol we're on, things like that. Then we'll send an echo request and an echo reply back to make sure everything worked. Then we'll exchange some data. And then hopefully the code still works. 
or maybe we're done, and then in that case, um, we'll terminate the request, and then the, the, the link is terminated. So the, the link like comes up and goes down as you're using it. So uh, I guess we already covered that, covered that, good enough. All right, there are different packet types, and again, I wouldn't spend a whole ton of time on this part, um, trying to memorize all these things. This part, you don't really need. You know, really, nine times out of 10, something like this, you know, a point-to-point -point link that is a private link between you and somebody else that was set up with PPP, once the link comes up, you typically don't have issues, and if you do, it's an issue with your provider. So you're not going to be doing a lot of troubleshooting. Now, if you're going to move on to the CCNP and the CCIE and you're going to go work for a provider, you need to focus on this stuff. So if that's your goal, then you need to memorize all these things because, again, you're going to be troubleshooting. You're going to be at AT&T and you're going to be like the guy who figures out how funked up AT&T is. So <laughs> you don't want to be that guy typically. All right, so blah. So... The big thing with PPP is it supports authentication either through PPP or CHAP, CHAP, and it allows compression. It allows you to compress your data using Stacker or Predictor. Now, why do you do that? Again, typically we don't normally compress our data because it's an extra step. You know, your router would have to compress the data, then you send the data, then the other router has to uncompress the data. So it adds extra overhead to the information going across. So we typically don't want to do that. Now, if you've got a low speed link and you're trying to get more data across it, maybe compression is your answer. Uh, but nine times out of 10, we're not trying to use that. All right, how to configure it. Here's where the money is. All right, we're gonna talk about blah, blah. Oh, callback. Callback is a very interesting feature and it's been out there for years and everybody kind of implements this. Any kind of protocol that has security um, has its own implementation of callback. And what callback does is whenever you try to make a request, like let me put it to you like uh, you're at home and you have a modem and you dial into your company's network with the modem. What happens is you try to make the connection, you type in your username and password to connect. Once you're authenticated, the server at your work hangs up on you and then calls you back. And then you make the actual connection and then you can start transferring data. Now the purpose to that is, if a bad guy gets your username and password and he goes to his house and he calls into the server and uses your username and password, the server hangs up on him and then the server calls your house. So the, so the server guarantees or callback guarantees that you're only going to go to whoever you need to. Well, with PPP, you can do that too. You can say, hey, you know, whenever you get a link or a request from this device or this IP address, you need to hang up and then call them back. And that way you're always going to make the connection with who you're supposed to make, no matter who initiated the request. So callback is kind of a neat feature. And then multi-link, multi-link goes back to um, like ether channel, um, we talked about on switching from phase three, um, or really link aggregation. We can have multiple lines that we use, uh, so we can have three T1s and kind of link them together. All right, so again, we go, you have to create a host name, especially if you're going to do um, authentication. So then you go into the interface that you're going to use, in this case, a 0000 on the left and 0000 on the right, and then you turn it on, encapsulation PPP. So remember, for HDLC to turn it on, it's just encapsulation HDLC, and for PPP just to turn on the basic stuff, it's encapsulation PPP. And that turns on the encapsulation, so that decides the format of the frames that you're going to be sending back and forth. Now, if you want compression on, you have to do this on both ends, compress space predictor or compress space stacker. So that's the two that you have. You either have predictor, or I'm sorry, in this case, it's just stack, S-T-A-C. Uh, again, nine times out of 10, you typically do not want to compress your data because it's going to slow the travel back and forth because your router's going to have to do extra stuff. Um, typically, if we're only dealing with a T1, we don't have a very robust router. Uh, but if you're dealing with nine T1s, maybe you do have a robust router. Maybe you do want to compress. Who knows? But you get the idea. All right. You can also do the quality. You know, if your link isn't that great um, and you have some issues, you can change the like do AAO PPP space quality space 80. So um, the, the quality requirement is, hey, um, it needs to be up 80% of the time, otherwise it goes down.
So I don't know if I explained that, I guess, correctly enough. What this says is if I'm not getting 80% of my bandwidth or the line quality degrades past or below 80%, I won't use the line until it goes back up to 80%. Uh, I hope that helps because uh, I guess at first I wasn't quite clear when I was talking about that. All right, so again, if you're doing multi-links, um, you just go into the different groups uh, to whatever interfaces and make them part of the multi-link group. So in this case, um, I create the multi-link interface, and then I go to serial 010, I add him, then I go to 011, and I add him to the group. So now both of these serial connections would both be multi-linked into the same multi-link group. All right, to verify, show interface serial 000, you'll see the encapsulation, that kind of stuff. Show PPP multi-link. Um, remember, if you're using more, more than one port for that, or more than one T1. All right, with PPP, you can also turn on authentication so that you won't pass data to another device unless that device has authenticated to you. Now, PAP is the weakest of the two. Uh, it only has a two-way handshake. CHAP, Challenge, uh, Challenge Handshake Authentication um, Protocol, is the three-way handshake. So CHAP would be more secure than PAP. PAP is Password Authentication Protocol, and CHAP is Challenge Handshake uh, Authentication Protocol. So again, blah, that slide doesn't really give me a whole lot. Blah. Here they talk about the encapsulation. So let's go look at the commands. So once you do the authentication, so authentication, or, or sorry, encapsulation PPP, enter. Then it's PPP authentication, and then what authentication you want to use. PPP authentication CHAP, PPP authentication CHAP PAP, PPP authentication PAP CHAP. Now, if you just do one, you will only accept the authentication from the other side if they use that one. If you put both, it will try for the first one first, and if that fails, then it'll default and try again with the other authentication. So that's why sometimes you have two of them showing up. All right, so to set up the authentication, <laughs> I'm on R1, and I say, hey, username is going to be R2, the other guy, and then password is going to be same one. Then I go to serial interface, I put an IP address on there for IP4, I put an IP6 IP address. Then I set encapsulation PPP, and then PPP authentication PAP, and then PPP PAP, sent space username R1, so I'm going to send username R1, and the password is going to be same one. So now over here, he created a username of R1, but he's going to send username R2. So over here, the username is R2, and the password is the same one. So he, when he tries to connect to R1, he's going to send the password or the username of R2, because that's what you've set up over here. So that gets confusing. So if you've got questions, bring that up in class. The sent username is what username and password did he set up on his end, because that's what you want to send to him. What does he have in his local database? So that's why we send R2 here when he used R2 over here. And you know, I don't know any other way to make that more clear. So if you're confused, bring it up in class when you first come in, and we'll diagram it out on the board and go from there. All right. Or I can do PPP authentication chap. Just don't forget if the if the CCNA asks you or something like that, you know, obviously PAP is weaker than CHAP. All right, Whee! troubleshooting. All right, you know, remember every command has a debug, debug PPP. Now, if you debug PPP, you'll get a whole bunch of stuff. But I might debug PPP packet, debug PPP negotiation, debug PPP authentication. If I can't get PPP to even talk together, I, then I'm obviously it's the authentication I'm having a problem with. So I want to debug PPP authentication. If the authentication is working and I'm having problems, um, intermittent problems going across, I might want to look at the packets. But bottom line is we just debug PPP authentication and then every time something happens that involves PPP, you're going to see a message come up. Hey, no name was received from the peer. 
So obviously that other guy's sent username was incorrect or he must not have sent that up. So in summary, blah, 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 blah. Basically with your point to points, you're going to negotiate with your provider. Depending on your provider, you're either going to work together to say, hey, I want this, or they're just going to tell you this is what you get. Um, so again, it all depends on your provider. And then you set up your end. You're only responsible for your router and the line between your router into the smart jack, which is typically just an Ethernet cable. Um, so it depends on how your organization set up, how far away your router is from the smart jack location. You know, typically our router, our core router, um, is in our server room. But the smart jack is always located in the phone room way down in the basement somewhere that's in an unfinished nasty room with spiders and all kinds of weird bugs. All right, don't forget about the your, your serial cable. You have a DCEN and a DTEN. The DCEN sets the clock rate. Um, the old model of the CSU-DSU um, was a separate unit. Nowadays, the CSU-DSU is built into the WIC card, um, and it's been like that for at least eight, nine years. And then don't forget, um, with PPP, it's an open standard and it supports authentication. And the authentication choices are PAP or CHAP, with PAP being the weakest one. All right, so that wraps up this chapter. You know, again, not a whole lot of commands there. You know what, there was what, a total of five commands or something like that. Make sure you have that information written down somewhere on your pen and paper. Hey, here's the five commands for, you know, PAP, and here's the one command for HDLC. And, you know, here's what, you know, here's the difference between PAP and CHAP, um, that kind of thing. And really, that's all you need to know. The CCNA does not spend a lot of time on point-to-point -point or channels. Uh, you might see two questions on the entire CCNA about that, uh, unless you get really unlucky and for some reason you just draw a bunch of questions on that. Uh, but I've never seen a ton of questions on that, uh, mostly like one or two, things like that. And again, the big one is, hey, you know, you know what command shows me the cable type? Um, point to points are really kind of going away especially in the US you know now we're, we're seeing more of these networks like Time Warner Cable that are building these big you know um, MPLS systems um, that are so much more reliable and fault tolerant and easier to work with um, than these old T1s that you had this private piece of copper and if somebody hit a telephone pole you lost all your T1s and that kind of stuff so that's really the way the market's moving. Uh, and Cisco knows it, and they're, they're, they're kind of turning down their focus on this point-to-point -point stuff. But you get the idea, uh, but it's still good to know because, again, a lot of very small businesses you know, still have T1 lines. So, again, if you have any questions, make sure you bring them up in class, and I'll see you there.